We're going to be going into the uh, uh, the second chapter of Ezra. And if I'm not mistaken, I, I think that I did this study once before, but it was in Greensboro with Tom and I and uh, Steve. We were talking about a few things, um, but I really couldn't find my notes on that. I was kind of busy. But anyway, um, we'll go ahead and uh, pray, and then we'll get into the study. So, uh, God, thank you uh, for this evening. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, this day uh, that you have given us, Father. Um, uh, thank you for um, uh, sparing uh, my family, Father, for of a tragedy. And that we're able to um, stand here today in some way resume a normal life pattern, I guess. Um, but thank you for um, what happened because it allowed us to kind of regroup and come back together um, and put you first. And so as we... Um, go into this word uh, about Ezra, God, uh, uh, we ask that you would just um, remind us uh, how important it is to always keep you first and not try to mix a bunch of stuff in there um, and not keep you at the front and that's at the center and not to always be complacent or looking at things rather than looking at you. And so I thank you again for this day. Um, I thank you for this time for a Bible study. Uh, I ask that you would just uh, bless us this evening with your, with your kindness and your reminders and to do the same for the women's ministry, uh, that you would um, refresh their hearts tonight. Um, if there is someone over there that needs comforting or needs a word of peace from you, God, I ask that you would just speak uh, through whoever, whoever's teaching there and provide that to that individual. And the same here in this room. And so while we are separated from our families and our children for this moment, God, we ask that we would be good stewards of this time and that they will be protected in our absence. In your precious name, name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. So we're going to be in um, um, Ezra chapter 2. I'm going to try to read from these trifocals. They don't really work for me. but So I'll read it from the New King James Version first. Now this, this second chapter, if you've already read it, really... Uh, breaks down who all is returning from, um, I don't want to say exile, uh, I don't know if that's the right word, but the, these, 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 the children of Israel are returning from the Babylonian captivity. And this is um, the first wave, if you want to call it that, um, that Ezra is uh, recording um, and so we'll read that I don't want to go get too far because um, <laughs> what confused me about this Bible study was when I sat down to read it I, I learned something that um, it's like a, a it was almost like watching a movie anybody ever seen a movie that um you look at, you're looking at this movie and it's like, okay, where are they at in this movie? You know, it's like, um, oh, they went back to the, are they just showing you what happened before and now they're showing you Russ, what's happening now? And you're like, oh, I can't, I can't even catch up with the movie. Oh, oh, you got to see this. And it reminds me of my brother, he says, oh, yeah, you got to see the first movie first before you look at that movie, you know, before this one even makes sense to you, you know. That's kind of like um, this first, the first six chapters of this book, because Ezra 
remember, didn't, Ezra wasn't born during the first six portions of this book. He didn't really come on the scene until like chapter seven. Uh, chapter, was it four? or I think it's either four or seven when he was actually on the scene and uh, witnessing um, the children, the second wave of, of Israel, of children of Israel coming in back into the land. So Ezra is basically recording, uh, 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 I'm not sure if he, if he heard it or he had um, uh, some sort of uh, records that he was recording at this point. So again, he's going through who all came back. So in the second chapter, we'll start out, it says, now these are the people of the province who came back from the cap came back from the captivity of those who had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away to Babylon, and who returned to Jerusalem and Judah, everyone to his own city. Um, I didn't get a chance to go back and read last or hear last week's study, but whoever did it, I'm sure they uh, covered how we are coming to this juncture in history and how the children of Israel ended up in Babylon and how um, uh, in God's word, in, I think it was in uh, uh, Haggai or Zephaniah where they prophesied about the downfall of the kingdom of Jerusalem um, and how they would be overthrown and uh, sent into captivity. And so um, this is, uh, again, God's prophesying word that they would return to their land in 70 years. And so this is the 70th year. Um, and so there would be some excitement because um, if you're my age um, right now, and I would have heard about this going into the land 20 years ago. And so I would have been looking forward to this day, this day of returning uh, to my um, forefathers' homeland. It's not a land that I've ever seen before, but I've heard about how grand it was when it was originally built. And so I'm looking forward to this day. Um, and I'm sure there are some comparisons that we can all make to... Um, how we feel about um, something that makes us excited. Um, and I, the first thing that comes to my mind is um, um, like buying a new car. I was telling my wife, I said, um, we were talking about motorcycles this weekend. Don't ask me why. It just came to my mind. And I said, there's this motorcycle place down there by my job. I said, and when I go to lunch, I said, I go by there. I said, and usually when I'm at lunch, I'm walking and I said, if I go by the motorcycle place, I'll call my brother. He rides motorcycles. And I start taking pictures and sending them to him, you know. And uh, I said, man, the motorcycle, sure, we was watching, uh, we was watching Price is Right. And right after Pastor Dave said, don't look at Price is Right. I was at home looking at Price is Right. right. And, uh, and so the guy had a, um, um, did he want a, he want a, he want a car. And um, so it brought up, it reminded me of this motorcycle. And I said, yeah, I said, it's like almost like buying a motorcycle, you know. I said, I think that thing was shiny. I said, it looks so good. I said, it was relatively inexpensive. I said, I thought that motorcycles were more expensive than I than than they are. I mean, I mean, they're expensive, but I mean, I thought, I mean, as shiny as that thing was, I thought it would probably be like forty thousand dollars, you know. But the one they had out there was like I don't know twelve thousand or something like that. I said, man, that, that's almost reasonable, you know. And then I thought about it. I said, yeah, probably is. If you really wanted one, I said, but soon enough, man, that sucker get dirty. You got to get out there and clean it up, man. That's a whole lot of parts you got to clean up. Then the, the allure of it just kind of goes away for me after that, you know. And so as the children of Israel are going into um, this, 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 have this vision, um, remember, the, these elders are painting this picture for them, how grand um, the temple of, of Solomon was when it was originally built, you know, the grandiose of it, you know. And here they are 70 years later going back into this land of ruin, 
you know, they but they have this idea of man, this thing is outstanding. This is this is not going to be anything like I've ever seen in my life. And so as we get later on into um, the chapter, you know, you start to see this uh, this allure start to fade. And, and so we'll go ahead and uh, move on in chapter three. It says that. So it says here, um, not chapter, but verse three, the people were Perushi. There were two hundred uh, two thousand one hundred and seventy two. The people of Sephaniah, three hundred and seventy two. The people of Ra, seven hundred and seventy five. The people of uh, Pata, Moab, of the people of Jeshua and Yohab, two hundred eight two thousand eight hundred and twelve. And the people of Elam, 1,254. And the people of Zatu, 945. And the people of Zakai was 760. And there was the people of Benai, was 642. And the people of Bibai, I guess, 623. And the people of Asgab, 120. One, I'm sorry, 1,222. And then the people of Adonakim, 666. And the people of Big Vey, 2,056. And the people of Adan, 454. And the people of Atur of Hezekiah, uh, 98. And the people of Abizai was 322. 23 and the people of Jorah was 112 and the people of Hashami was 223 and the people of Gabar was 95 and the people of Bethlehem was 123 and it goes on and then the men of Zetophah was 56 the men of Anatoth 128 and the people of as Marveth, 42, 42. And the people of Kirjith, Aram was uh, Sephira and Baroth, 743. And then the people of Kama and Geba, 621. I mean, these are a lot of people. We can, I can go down the list of all the people, which I will. Um, but here we have so many people who are gathering up. And I thought about today, I said, man, you know, I was watching the news this morning. They were talking about that um, DACA thing, man. And they were showing this dude being separated from his family or being deported. You know, and I, and I started to wonder, I said, man, that's like, you know, think of all the people that you have to round up. Um, to deport and is this something like a deportation um, but what came to my mind was that this was prophesied by God just like anything else I, I believe that happens uh, when, it's, when it comes to uh, a similarity that God gives us you know, and the first thing he reminds you of is scripture. And he asks you, you know, is that something spiritual? Is that something that God is doing? I mean, that's what it asks. That's what I ask myself. You know, not that it's uh, any one person's doing, but is this something that God has ordained? And what does that look like? We have a lot of people who are up in arms about this deportation thing and um, these people going back to, uh, since they grew up here, they're going back to a country that they have no knowledge of, you know. And if and when I'm reading this, I'm these people are going back to this country. They were raised up in Babylon. They've been there 70 years. They have no idea of what they're going back to. But the difference is that these folks are moving as a family. They're not going as separate individuals. They're going as tribes. They're going as 
Uh, I guess they all speak the same language. Uh, um, I guess there is another example, you know, different nations and different, uh, um, different races of people um, because they all do speak different languages since uh, the Tower of Babel, right? They're all different nations. They're all different races at this time, but they're all coming from the same place. It's like... Um, you know, all of you guys in here, you know, you, we, uh, we all may be Americans, but we're all from different places. And if they were to pick us up and move us somewhere, we would be going somewhere as together, but we would be going somewhere as different nations of people going into a land that's foreign. And then so um, I'm not sure if they bonded together in that when they went. Or if they all just continue to be separate. I th one thing that I found was interesting, this is probably later, was that, um, and I think I read it, and I know it's to be true, is that when they were, I can't even want to use the word exile, from this land, they, this land was then uh, not occupied, but it was, was it populated or it was, um, they imported some people, right? They imported other folks to kind of live on the land that was the Samaritans. I didn't know that until today. Uh, that was the Samaritan people. And so when you get into uh, the latter chapters and they are being opposed to building this temple, they're being opposed by the Samaritans. And so therefore you had this original conflict between the Samaritans and the Jewish community. And so, yeah, so just this, um, this whole idea of just picking up this group of people ordained uh, by God, uh, God gave Cyrus this word to move all these people to rebuild his temple. And so I just wondered today to myself, I said, man, is that, you know, is the, is the idea of moving people one of, is, is that God's idea? You know, is that something that God has ordained? Or is that something that we have just decided for ourselves to be the right move? And so, well, that's just a, that's just a side note that's, not anything scripture, just what the Lord was laying on my heart today. So we'll go ahead and continue. That's uh, uh, verse 32. I believe it was, right? Yeah. So the people of Haram was 320, and the people of Lot, Hadid, and Ano, 725, and then the people of Jericho, 345, and the people of Sinai was three. 1,630, and then the priests, the sons of Jedidiah of the house of Yeshua, 973, and the sons of Enmer, 1,052, the sons of Pashur, 1,247, and the sons of Harim, 1,017, and the Levites, the sons of Yeshua and Cadmiel of uh, the sons of Hodaviah was 74. The singers, the sons of Aspa. Remember, if you're not familiar with Aspa, he is uh, one of the writers of Psalms, I think it's 50, and I think it's 77 through 80 something, if I'm not mistaken. And then you have the sons of the gatekeepers, the sons of Shalom, the sons of Atter, the sons of Talmud, and the sons of Akkub. I can't think of that, that one thing that um, that Psalm says. It doesn't come to my mind right now. Uh, the sons of Akba, the sons of Hatita, and the sons of Shobiah, 139 in all. And then you have Zeph. Hinnom, the sons of Zehi, was the sons of Hazuapa, the sons of I'm not good I'm not good with these words, man. So uh, Tabaoth, the sons of Kiros, the sons of Shia, the sons of Padon, the sons of Lebanon, the sons of Hagapa, the sons of Akub. You had the sons of Hagab, the sons of Shalmei, the sons of Hanani. Is that what it says? Hanan. Then you had the sons of Gedel, the sons of Gahar, the sons of 
Riaya, the sons of Rezin, the sons of Nikoda, the sons of Gazem, the sons of Uza, the sons of Pasich, the sons of Bese, the sons of Ashna, the sons of Miuim, the sons of Nephuism. And you had the sons of Batbuk, the sons of Hagufar, the sons of Hafor, and the sons of Bazluth, and the sons of Mahida. Am I reading the same chapter? The sons of Harsha, the sons of Barkos, the sons of Caesarea, and the sons of Tamah, and the sons of Neziah, and the sons of Hathipha. Then, it's 56, you had the sons of Solomon's servants, the sons of Sorte, the sons of Sophirith, and the sons of Peruda, and the sons of Jaila, and the sons of Darkum. These are Solomon's servants. How old are they? The sons of Solomon's servants. Seventy years. Let's just say they are probably about, what, 35, 40? Right? 35 or 40. So they've been in Babylon for almost 40 years. Where it was. Uh, then you have the sons of, in 57, the sons of Shephatath, the sons of Hatil, the sons of Pasareth, of Zabaim, and the sons of Amin. 58, you have all the Nethimim, and the children of Solomon's servants were 392. How many servants did Solomon have? I think he had thousands of servants. Right? But only 392 return. Well, these are the children of the children of Solomon's servants. 392. And all these people that died, died in captivity. It's almost like the folks that died because they didn't want to cross over into um, who didn't want to uh, what am I thinking who died in the desert on the way to the promised land right who didn't want to um, you know it's kind of the same thing really right because how do how is it that not we always say we're not pointing the finger at the children of Israel. And it's, it's always really the same story, really, right? It's always a story of man wanting to do his own thing, really. What it boils down to, you know, um, because as we go into this book later, what we're going to find out is, and I ask myself, well, what was it? Because later, you know, there were some people who decided not to come back, right? So what was it about these people that they decided to uproot themselves and to go into a land that God had chosen? You know, um, it's, almost, it's almost like we was doing a Bible study at uh, children's ministry on Sunday, not a long, make a long story short. And the story was about the, uh, the bridegroom and the wedding, you know, and what it, the scripture points out is that, you know, you know, God has a wedding and the, there are certain people who were invited who didn't come. And then there were, then he sent on another request for the people who were invited to come, and they still didn't come. So he says, I'm opening up the wedding to everybody. So now it's open for all people to come. But just think of all of these people, because when, you, when we continue to read down this list, we're going to find that there are some people in here in this return who really who couldn't identify themselves with 
the Jewish community, or maybe not the Jewish community, but they didn't have a lineage with the priesthood. I should say it that way, because that's the way it says it in the word. And so they're partaking in the um, fest, in the spiritual, in the, in the spiritual, I guess, um, uh, leading of the people was denied and it was left up to God to make the decision whether or not they were called or ordained to uh, lead the people. And basically it was, uh, they just uh, rolled it a dice at that point, right? But nonetheless, you know, they decided to come anyway, just like the people that were invited to the wedding or all the folks that were not initially invited, they still came when they were invited. I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a good thing because, I mean, you know, if, as I said in the beginning, you know, if you've never seen this land that they are asking you to go see, what would make you, and I'm, I'm going on, I'm, bas- I'm going on what I know to be in the later studies, what would make you leave your comfortable living to go to a land that you've never seen? And I thought about this, that's it, and I, I didn't have a chance to get any pictures, but have any of you ever uh, lived through a hurricane? How about a flood, a mudslide? How about a war? Okay, I guess my question is that when those things happen, we often hear questions about why would they go back and rebuild? Why would you, if you lived on the North Carolina coast and you knew that Hurricane Sandy was coming and it came and it wiped away everything you ever owned or had, but when it was all clear for you to, to go back, you went back and you rebuilt. And everybody says, why in the world would those crazy people <laughs> go back down there to live? <laughs> you know, <laughs> why? What in the world? They must be crazy. And then the insurance company drops out of the bottom and says, we're not insuring anybody over here anymore. And you say, well, I'm still, I love it over here. That's where I'm going. What about the people who live in war, war-torn countries and everything has just been made? This is what we're talking about, right? We're talking about the Babylonians came I mean, and the Bible says they, they destroyed everything. They, I mean, man, they took down the walls, and it was nothing but rubble. If you go to the, um, the book of Haggai, this is all prophesied in the book of Haggai, and God says there won't be anything left. And just think of that, man. So this is not like a hurricane that happens today. And then the first responders come in and uh, the FEMA, wherever they are, and they come in and clean up half of the stuff, get the streets all cleaned out. And, you know, the foundation of the homes are pretty much wiped out. And it's, you can go back and start over uh, a couple of months, maybe I don't know, sometimes, in some instances, a couple of years later, I have some friends who came up here from Lumberton. Man, they still don't have a home um, down there. Um, but in this instance, this land has laid <laughs> untouched for 70 years. I can't even imagine what it would look like after 70 years. I mean, I can't even, I mean, I, I, I tried to find a picture. I said, what 
does a land look like if nobody touches it in 70 years? And you're going back to it to build. You're going to start building. And they're going to provide you with money, I guess they call it a, a, a medium of exchange. They're going to give you cattle, right? This is the first decree from Cyrus. And you're going to start. But the scripture says it'll never be like anything that was there. It, it'll just be you know, basic. it just be basic, a place to worship. Hmm. I guess I say that because nowadays I don't see people willing to give up their Xboxes to go build anything. And especially if they are comfortable. So that only leads me to know that if God has ordained it and he puts it in your heart, it doesn't matter what it looks like, you're going to go. You're going to go anyway, you know. And so that's what I'm saying about this whole thing about these people, man. You know, I might not know what it looks like right now, but, and it's confusing to me, but whatever it is, whatever it is that's going on in this world around us today, it looks crazy. We can trust like these children being moved that God has a plan and um, and he's going to do something with that plan you know and I heard I was I had to go back and really re, re listen to this teaching um, and of course you know it, we, that's where we are right now but during the tribulation period after the temple is rebuilt later in later on in the prophecy, you know, it gets torn down again. And that's when the second coming, we need the God is going to tear it down again. But right now, he says, I want my temple rebuilt. I want you to come. And that what I find amazing is, is that this guy or, or these these kings who determined to help their children of Israel, who God, I guess God puts it in their heart to help their children of Israel because they always say, your God, your God, your worship, your God. So you know it's not, he's not worshiping them himself. But God has ordained him to enlist or, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Um, not enlist, but to um, encourage, I guess I can use that word, the children of Israel to go and rebuild this temple. And what does he say? Please pray for me and my sons. That's amazing. You know, know, it sounds like to me that here's this person who God has put this spirit in his heart, this motive in his heart for his people people in one one version it calls it his uh, God's holy race of people you know I said race of people holy race that's racist you know I said how in the world can they be a holy race of people but it is it is I mean if you look up race r-a-c-e in the scripture uh, I think you find it between 20 and 30 times but the in the in the new testament it refers to as race as paul would describe it as running the race but in the hebrew scriptures it describes it as a race of people a nation of people and this is god's holy nation of people and so this man or this person has been chosen by God to set his people I guess from like from Egypt free to go and do his work again 
you know. And so the wedding, one more time, you know, we have all been invited to this wedding. Even though, even if you don't worship Christ as your Savior at this moment, the wedding is still happening and you're still invited. Even though you may not be able to find your genealogy with the priests and the Levites, you're still invited to come and help. It doesn't really matter. Just come and help. And these people picked up everything they had and they went. And they went to build the temple of God and do God's work. You know, it's... it's hmm. Even though you may not have much to give or much to bring, because I can only imagine these folks really didn't have a lot. Because the distinction is if they did, they would have been like the other group that came in a second wave who stayed behind. There was, it's like us. In our previous lives, there was nothing for us to hold on to in our previous lives. We basically had nothing. And so God's promise for me was peace, grace, and mercy. Now, I might not seem to understand all this about eternity and and I might not even understand I, I had to confess that I really don't understand a lot about this book you know what's what's happening here but you know and, and I really was really I don't have any notes I usually have notes I'm usually pre you know I'm not that I'm not prepared I usually have notes and you know PowerPoint presentations and things like that you know to kind of illustrate but um you know, today, I think it's time for all of us to really check, get a heart check. Um, because it's one thing to, or it's one thing for me to, you know, come out with a bunch of PowerPoints. But if I'm not really, you know, trying to allow or allowing God to use me, in a way that I'm not used to, like these people. You know, I don't, then I don't, I'm not really walking with the Lord. Um, and so what I see is that uh, these people are packing up and they're on a journey and they're walking with the Lord. And we'll go to 59, what time we got? Five minutes. Okay, when I say 59, all right. And these were the ones who came from uh, Tel Mia, uh, Tel Harsha, Cherub, Adin, and Enmer, but they could not identify their father's house or their genealogy, whether they were of Israel. So the sons of Delilah, the sons of Tobiah, and the sons of, um, what's his name? Nicodia, 652, and the sons of the priests, the sons of Havilah, the sons of Kaz, and the sons of Barzillai, the, who took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai, Barzillai, the Gileadite, and was called by their name. And in 62, we have their salt, their listing among those who were, these sought their listing among those who were registered by genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, they were excluded from the priesthood as defiled. And the governor said to them that they should not eat of the most holy things till a priest could consult with the Urim and the Thum. And then the holy assembly together was 42,360. Besides their male and female servants of whom were there were seven thousand three hundred and thirty seven what does I say? I got these glasses on man, I still can't see. That's a shame. Let's see, uh, the whole assembly together was forty two thousand three hundred and sixty. 
uh, 65 says, besides their male and female servants, of whom there were 7,337 and 300, 200 men and women singers. I had something to say about the singers, but I forgot. Uh, their horses were 736, their mules 245, their camels 435, and their donkeys 6,770. 6, Some of the heads of the father's houses, when they came to the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, offered freely for the house of God to erect it in its place. Accordingly to their ability, they gave to their treasury for the work two one mm, sixty one thousand gold drachmans, five hundred minas of silver, and one hundred priestly garments. So the priests and the Levites, some of the people and, and the singers, the gatekeepers and the Nethinim dwelt in their cities, and all Israel in their cities. So, I guess they made it, right? They finally got to Jerusalem. But listen, this was an 800-mile journey. 800 miles. I got a friend of mine who wants me to go camping with him in February 23rd. He said, three days up in the mountains. I said, man, it's going to be cold. <laughs> I said, what? I said, mm, it's going to be cold, man. He said three days. He said, we walking maybe 30 miles, maybe. This is 800. With no shoes on. That's a long way. And I think I read they were going to be tracking probably about 10 miles a day. So, and I'm thinking, what I heard well, they usually travel at night. So, maybe if you're moving at night, you're not so cold, yet and still, 800 miles. So the other thing about this, uh, we, I said briefly about the, um, the Urim and the Thum. You know, the, this was important then. Nobody knows what the Urim and Thummim is now. So I, I think what I, the best explanation I heard was, a again, it was a, a toss in the dark or a roll of the dice. Um, yes or no. It might as well have been subjective, but I guess it was the only way to be fair was just to roll the dice. Uh, nobody knows if the dice were fixed or anything. One was heavy on one side or not. They just rolled them. But, um, but either way, uh, just think of it now. Since Christ has come, genealogy has no place any longer. You don't have to identify with any family. You don't have to be identified in order to be a minister in the house of God. You don't have to be a part of the family you know, if God has called you into a ministry of some sort, you know, amen, you're welcome to come. You're welcome to come. You know, from the birth of Christ, I mean, not from the birth, but the death and the resurrection of Christ that did away with all of the genealogy work that was um, put in place. And so, and I think that that would be the ending of the story because you know again there on all of our parts or even on especially on my part you know I feel and I, uh, that there needs to be a greater sacrifice what that looks like uh, I, I really don't know um, but I think that you know um anyway but anyway so um so this second 
book or second chapter of Ezra is just a, again, Ezra is recording this. And remember that Ezra is not born yet. And so Ezra is just recounting if, if like in most instances, what has been um, handed down to him and through uh, historical records. And so because what you will find later is that as they go to try and uh, continue building the temple, then the records still have to be dug out again from King Cyrus uh, to for the initial decree to begin building. And so, you know, this is a, a long time coming, and this is prophesied about in the book of Haggai. I'm not, I'm really not um, big on, not big on, but I'm not really not um, abreast into prophecy. Um, because it all, again, it's always like looking at a movie that's already started, you know, for me, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to catch up as to what happened, you know, and um, I don't know all the players, and I don't know what all they said, and, our, and, our, and sometimes, you know, I got one bad ear, and so I really can't hear what they say unless they say it in my good ear, you know, and so I'm twisting and turning and trying to figure it out. But I'm relying on God's Holy Spirit to speak to me through this word. And so, and so what I would suggest is that uh, as we travel through this book with Ezra, as was suggested to me, was to make sure that you familiarize yourself with the books of Zephaniah, uh, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, and Haggai. Uh, because these books are in correlation to uh, this re recounting of what happened. And if, I'm, if somebody knows another book out there in the Bible that um, kind of helps you understand exactly what's going on here. I mean, it, it's pretty, once you learn where you are, and, um, you can kind of pick up on it, but there are a lot of reference points as you go through this book about what was already prophesied about in Daniel as well. Um, and so I highly suggest you guys to um, look at that. Um, I heard one guy tell me today, um, you know, that even in reading those other accounts, you have um, uh, some, some prophesying about uh, Jordan and Israel and Syria and the things uh, that are happening right now. Um, uh, and that, um, how did he put that? Um, at, this, uh, at some point that, <laughs> this may be a little off topic, but we consider Russia to be our enemy, you know. Um, right now, you know, I mean, I, you don't know. But at some point, remember this, though, as Bibles, the scripture says, they will attack Israel. Point blank, period, man. So uh, I highly suggest you guys uh, kind of read, read that, man. Read those books um, and allow the Lord to speak to you and lead you. On that path um, to that history lesson, man. So you kind of, like again, for me, it's kind of a lot of fuzzy. It's kind of fuzzy because I, it kind of, I can't really piece it together right now. But um, I'm on a good, I'm going a good start. So with that, man, we're going to end.